thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with such a, a great organization. And I'd like to begin by asking you to tell me what you would think or what, what would you think if at the snap of my fingers, everybody in the world suddenly, instantaneously became aware of all the facts about genetically engineered foods and everybody's opinions became aligned with our very best scientific knowledge. Well, if we adhere to the routine rhetoric of the proponents of these products, we would have to predict that such a worldwide wave of enlightenment would quickly cause all opposition to them to vanish. Because in the rendition of reality that they propound, all of the opposition has been based in ignorance and all of the concerns about risks are just due to an improper understanding of science. But in reality, in this world we actually inhabit, the phenomenon that would quickly vanish is not the opposition to the foods, but the foods themselves. That's right, if the actual facts became widely known, the entire genetically engineered food venture would quickly collapse. And that is why, despite the pretensions about wanting to educate the public, the proponents of genetically engineered foods have routinely suppressed or distorted critical facts. My book documents case after case in which eminent scientists and scientific institutions have stooped to deception in order to enable the GE food venture to advance. Basic facts of biology have been twisted. The process of creating genetically engineered foods has been deceptively described in order to make it appear far less dis disruptive and far more precise than it actually is. And false statements have consistently been issued about the tests on these foods to cover up troubling results. Further, the evidence that demonstrates the distortion of the evidence is solid, and its solidity has been attested by many experts. For instance, John Eichard, a professor emeritus of agricultural economics at the University of Missouri, has stated that the evidence presented in my book is comprehensive and irrefutable. And the molecular biologist David Schubert, a press professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, has hailed the book as scientifically solid and truly outstanding. He also stated, and this is a quote, it dispels the cloud of misinformation that has misled people into believing that GE foods have been adequately tested and don't entail abnormal risk. Moreover, the irrefutable fact that the facts have been routinely misrepresented is in itself concrete evidence of how strongly the evidence weighs against the soundness of the GE food venture. Because if the evidence were truly supportive of the venture's safety, there would have been no need to distort it. And I think that's a no-brainer. If the facts are on your side, you're not afraid of them, in fact, you're proud of them, and it's your joy and privilege to clearly present them. It's only when the facts weigh against you that you resort to trickery. During the next 25 minutes, I'll point out some of the key distortions and falsehoods and clear up the confusion they've created. In the process, it will become evident that there are strong science-based reasons for reaching four basic conclusions. Producing new foods through recombinant DNA technology, which is the technical term for genetic engineering, is an inherently risky process. Two, every genetically engineered food poses an abnormal level of risk. Three, the safety of those on the market has never been adequately established. And four, some of them have already been shown to be harmful. I will also explain how the GE food venture is not only abnormally risky from the standpoint of biological science, but outright reckless when viewed from the perspective of computer science, and how the biotechnicians have utterly disregarded 
the hard-learned lessons that computer science has gained about the inherent risks of altering complex information systems. Let's first examine one of the biggest falsehoods that's been perpetrated in defense of GE Foods, the routine assertion that's, uh, that there's an overwhelming consensus that they're safe and that this consensus is based on extensive scientific evidence. Indeed, the strength of this purported consensus is claimed to be on a par with the degree of expert consensus about the reality of human-induced climate change. However, although there truly is a genuine expert consensus in the case of climate change, there has never been one in regard to GE Foods. And whereas every group of experts that has examined the data related to climate change has reached a common conclusion, many well-credentialed experts have raised cautions about GE Foods, and several respected scientific institutions have done so as well. For instance, in 2001, the Royal Society of Canada issued a major report concluding, A, that the default prediction for each GE food should be that the genetic alteration has induced unintended and potentially harmful side effects, and B, that it is scientifically unjustifiable, those were their words, to regard any GE food as safe unless its safety has been established through a course of testing far more rigorous than any regulators have yet required. The, that report has never been revised nor refuted, and it is as relevant today as when it was first issued. The British Medical Association and the editors of The Lancet, a premier medical journal, have also expressed concerns about the risks, and the Public Health Association of Australia has recently called for a complete moratorium on the planting and marketing of GE foods. The scientific experts at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration have likewise recognized that GE foods entail abnormal risks. This fact came to light in 1998 when my organization, the Alliance for Biointegrity, led a lawsuit that compelled the FDA to hand over more than 44,000 pages of its internal files on GE foods. Within that trove of documents were a number of memos from the agency's own scientists expressing concerns about the unusual risks of, genetic engin of the genetic engineering process and the need for all the foods it produces to undergo rigorous safety testing that's capable of detecting the potential harmful side effects. The pervasiveness of the concerns is attested by an FDA official who studied the expert input and declared, quote, the processes of genetic engineering and traditional breeding are different, and according to the technical experts in the agency, they lead to different risks. Moreover, the FDA's own biotechnology coordinator acknowledged there was not a consensus about safety in the scientific community outside the agency either. However, the FDA has an admitted agenda to foster biotechnology. And when it issued its policy in May of 1992, after having received all that input, it claimed that it was not aware of any information showing that foods derived by genetic engineering differ from other foods in any uniform or meaningful way. It also asserted that there was overwhelming consensus among scientists that GE foods are so safe they don't need to be tested at all, even though it knew that no such consensus existed. Accordingly, the FDA has allowed GE foods to enter the market without requiring even a smidgen of safety testing. If the FDA had told the truth and disclosed the extensive concerns of its own experts, the subsequent history of the GE venture would surely have been very different and might well have been very short. At the least, every any GE food that did reach the market would have been subjected to much more rigorous testing than regulators anywhere in the world have yet required. So that's one claim. What about the oft-repeated claim that no ingestible product of genetic engineering has ever been linked to a human health problem? Well, that's also baloney. <laughs> it's starkly at, starkly, starkly at odds with reality. In fact, the technology's very first ingestible product 
caused a major epidemic. It killed dozens of Americans. It seriously sickened between four and 5,000. Hundreds of those people are still invalids to this day. That product was a food supplement of the essential amino acid L-tryptophan that had been derived from genetically altered bacteria. Although it met the standards for pharmacological purity, like all other tryptophan supplements, it contained minute amounts of impurities. However, unlike the conventionally produced supplements, one or more of its accidental, accidental additions was highly toxic, even at extremely low levels. Because none of the tryptophan supplements produced via non-engineered bacteria had ever been linked to disease, and because genetic engineering can create unintended disruptions within the altered organisms, there were legitimate reasons to suspect that the engineering process had induced the formation of the extraordinarily toxic substance that caused the calamity. Consequently, the proponents of genetic engineering strove to convince the public that the technology was blameless. But to do so, they had to issue a string of deceptive statements. Those deceptions had been so successful that despite the fact the evidence points to genetic engineering as the most likely cause of the toxic contamination, most people who know of this tragedy are under the illusion that the technology has been completely exonerated. Worse, because GE proponents routinely claim that none of its project products has ever been linked to a health problem, most people aren't even aware that such a catastrophe even happened. And that includes most professionals in public health with whom I've spoken, completely oblivious to the fact that the very first ingestible product of genetic engineering caused a major epidemic right here in the United States. It's important to note that the toxic tryptophan incident has serious implications for all foods produced through genetic engineering. Those bacteria had not been altered with foreign genes. Rather, they were merely endowed with extra copies of some of their own. And they were not engineered to produce anything other than a beneficial substance they ordinarily make. But the forced overproduction of this normally benign substance apparently put abnormal stress on those organisms that led to the creation of an unintended and highly toxic byproduct. And almost every genetically engineered food yielding organism is being compelled to overproduce one or another chemical. And for that reason alone, poses an unusual risk. Now, the standard claim that the safety of GE foods has been thoroughly established by reliable testing cannot survive scrutiny either, especially considering that many well-conducted studies published in peer-reviewed journals have detected harm to the animals that consume GE food. In fact, in 2009, a systematic review of the toxicological studies on GE foods that was itself published in a peer-reviewed journal concluded that the results of most of them indicate that the products, quote, may cause hepatic, pancreatic, renal, and reproductive effects, and may alter hematological, biochemical, and immunologic parameters, the significance of which remains unknown, unquote. Another review that encompassed the additional studies that had been published up until August 2010 also provided cause for caution. It concluded there was an equilibrium between the research groups suggesting that GE crops are as safe as their non-GE counterparts and those raising still serious concerns. Now, obviously, the fact that more than 15 years after GE foods had first entered the market, half the published studies on them raised serious concerns in the eyes of objective scientific reviewers undermines the claim that their safety has been decisively established. And this conclusion is fortified when we examine some of the specific revolt results that accrued both before and after that date. For instance, a team of European University scientists published a paper in 2011 in which they reviewed the data from 19 of the feeding studies on GE, soy, and corn varieties that had already gone through the regulatory process, were on the market, and comprised 83% of the GE foods that people have been regularly eating. 
what they found was disturbing. 9% of the measured parameters, including blood and urine biochemistry and organ weights, were significantly disrupted in the animals that had eaten the GE feed. Moreover, the greatest disturbances were to the kidneys of the males and the livers of the females. And the scientists emphasized that because livers and kidneys are the major reactive organs in cases of chronic food toxicity, these results should be viewed as danger signs, something the regulators had not seen fit to do. Furthermore, when the negative results are so disturbing that they cannot be ignored, they're vehemently and unjustly attacked, and the research is routinely misrepresented. A prominent role in this misinformation campaign has been played by the UK's Royal Society, the world's oldest and most prestigious scientific institution. For example, the Society recently declared that no research has indicated that the genetic engineering process itself has caused any harm and that all problems have been attributed either to the specific gene introduced or to particular agricultural practices. But this assertion is flat out false. One major study did specifically link the GE process with harm. It was published in the eminent journal The Lancet and it revealed that GE potatoes, producing a foreign protein that's safe for mammals to eat, caused a problematic effect in the rats that consumed them compared to rats that ate the non-GE counterparts. Even though the non-GE potatoes had been spiked with the same level of foreign protein that was produced within the modified potatoes. Accordingly, the researchers concluded that some aspect of the GE process itself was significantly responsible for the result because they had ruled out the other possible factors. So it is only through the systematic misrepresentation of the facts by respected institutions and individuals and their willingness to disregard the ominous implications of the evidence that the GE food venture has been able to continue. And this disgraceful activity is being carried out in the name of science when it is actually subverting the basic principles of science. The extent to which the GE food venture has failed to be evidence-based and instead has rested on the denial and disregard of the evidence has been vividly summarized by Michael Antonio, a molecular geneticist at King's College London School of Medicine. If the kind of detrimental effects seen in animals fed GE food were observed in a clinical setting, the product's use would be halted and further research instigated to determine the cause and to find solutions. However, what repeatedly happens in the case of GE food is that despite increasing evidence of serious adverse health test results, <coughs> government and industry continue unabated with the development, endorsement, and marketing of these foods as if nothing has happened to the point they even seem to ignore the results of their own research. So even this short summary has revealed that from the standpoint of biological science, the GE food venture is significantly unsound. And when it's analyzed from the standpoint of computer science, the picture becomes even more troubling. Such an analysis is highly relevant because both genetic engineering and computer science are engaged in altering complex information systems. And computer science has learned a lot about the risks of making such alterations. Moreover, it has learned that these risks are inescapable, inescapable. Software engineers have learned that when the information systems they themselves have created become large and complex, there's no way to alter them with complete precision. Even when the alteration is a small refinement designed to improve the system's performance, the mere process of revising it in such an ostensibly minuscule manner is very likely to disrupt one or more of its other parts. This is an amazing phenomenon. Software systems are designed to be linear, which means they're structured so that a specific operation only produces a specific result. Operation X should only produce Y. 
However, despite the programmer's best efforts, their systems transcend the intended limits and to a significant degree behave in a nonlinear manner. There's a very high likelihood that some of the parts will interact in ways that were not planned and cannot be predicted, which means that operation X will not only yield Y, but might also generate Q and Z. Consequently, to reduce the potential for unintended interactions, software designers separate components that shouldn't interact and try to insulate them from such interaction. What they try to avoid is creating code that resembles a plate of spaghetti, okay? Because in they want to avoid writing what they call spaghetti code, a program in which the comments, components are complexly interacted and you can't really work on one without jostling around some of the other ones. Now, what they instead aim to create is ravioli code, and they call this ravioli code. They try to design systems in which the components that aren't supposed to interact are as independent from one another as the packets of cheese and vegetable in separate packets of pasta. Yet even though programmers have succeeded in designing systems that are uh, far more analogous to a plate of ravioli than a mound of spaghetti and have reduced the potential for unintended interactions, they have not been able to eliminate it. Such unwanted results continue to happen. Before examining how these risks are dealt with, let's compare the characteristics of human designed information systems with those of bioinformation systems. Let's compare man-made software with nature's software. As I noted, human-made systems are designed to be linear. And although they unavoidably become linear to some degree, they for the most part function as linear systems. But the situation is very different in the case of bioinformation systems. They are inherently nonlinear. The various parts are intricately interconnected, and every action can create a wide range of effects, many of which cannot be predicted. Now, in their endeavor to maximize manageability, software engineers avoid creating spaghetti code. Spaghetti, co spaghetti code is avoided. But bioinformation systems are the most extreme instances of spaghetti code. And even if a human being had been able to create them, he or she could not adequately comprehend the various interactions. Moreover, despite the substantial knowledge we humans have gained about the workings of bioinformation systems, the extent to which our understanding remains deficient should be profoundly humbling. In human design systems, the rules governing how the parts interact are clearly expressed in written form, but only a small fraction of the rules of bioinformation systems are known, and most of those pertain to the mechanics of gene expression. Yet, as numerous experts have emphasized, many of the most important rules don't operate at the level of the genes. For instance, Richard Stroman, who was a distinguished professor of cell biology at the University of California, Berkeley, asserted that the most important rules operate at a level higher than the genes, the level at which genes are organized into what he called functional arrays. And he noted that this level of gene management is not confined within the DNA, but is coextensive with the cell itself. Moreover, he emphasized that the dynamics operating at this level are different than the ones operating at the lower level, and that the interactions are far more complex to the extent that they are ultimately transcalculational, which, as he noted, is a mathematical term for mind-boggling. <laughs> Several other experts have also pointed out that bioinformation systems transcend DNA and ultimately extend throughout the entire organism, while also extending far beyond our comprehension. In addition to the vast differences, in the degree to which humans understand how the two types of system oper systems operate, there are also glaring differences in how uh, they make revisions to them. Software engineers insert new co code precisely where they want it without accidentally disrupting the way in which other code is written. 
Further, no unintended code enters the system. In contrast, bioengineers have been inserting DNA haphazardly. Their insertions have invariably disrupted sections of native DNA, and unintended pieces of DNA have almost always entered as well. So in revisions are precise and minimally disruptive in the case of the human design systems, in the case of bioinformation systems, the revisions through genetic engineering are imprecise and highly disruptive. So in light of these enormous differences, it would be reasonable to think that genetic engineers should exercise far greater caution than do software engineers. But the unfortunate reality is they exercise far less, shockingly less. Software engineers recognize the inescapable risks of altering complex information systems, and they deal with them responsibly. Accordingly, when they revise programs, they routinely conduct tests to detect whether any problems have been created. Moreover, there's a special class of software for which the testing is extremely rigorous. It's called life-critical software, software that can cause loss of life if it malfunctions. Examples of the programs that uh, govern pacemakers and x-ray machines and the ones that serve as airplane guidance systems. In the US and the European Union, not only are such programs required to undergo strict testing before they're allowed on the market, they also must be rigorously tested any time they're revised, no matter how minor the revision. The regulators will not accept arguments that the revised program is substantially equivalent to the former version. Instead, there must be a demonstration of safety achieved via systematic, stringent testing. But there's a glaring contrast in how risks are handled when disruptive alterations are made to the biggest, most complex, and yet least understood information systems on our planet. The biotechnicians don't adequately acknowledge the risks and largely deny them. Even the regulators have discounted them and assume there's little need for rigorous testing. The United States Food and Drug Administration claims that GE foods are so safe they don't need to be tested at all. And although regulators in the EU, in the EU and most other regions have required some testing, it's been minimal. For almost 20 years, GE foods were allowed on worldwide markets based solely on some superficial showing of substantial equivalence to their conventional counterparts, something that is never allowed in the case of life-critical software, despite the fact that a toxic tomato could cause far more human harm than a malfunctioning x-ray machine. And although the EU has finally required safety testing with a whole food, the tests are still remarkably lax by software standards. Even if GE Foods were compelled to undergo the same testing that's mandated for new pharmaceutical drugs, it would still fall short of the level of rigor that's required when changes are made to life-critical software programs. So again, with human-designed information systems, small revisions to life-critical systems are presumed to entail substantial risk. Rigorous testing is required. Bioinformation systems, major revisions to life-critical systems are presumed to be essentially safe, lax requirements, lax testing. Moreover, as my book demonstrates, if the kind of rigor that's required in software testing were mandated for GE foods, the entire venture would implode. Consequently, Even this simple technology sometimes doesn't function <laughs> properly. <laughs> Consequently, it is incurably risky. Now, you might be wondering, I still scratch my head about it, you might be wondering how the people promoting genetic engineering could have remained so oblivious to the risks of altering complex information systems. And the big part, a big part of that, of the answer is quite simple. They initially failed to appreciate that they were even dealing with intricate, highly coordinated information systems. And this constricted outlook has hung on and significantly colored all their subsequent thinking. 
Oh, excuse me, I went too far. We'll come to that. That was a preview of coming attractions. <coughs> as strange as it may seem to us now, when the genetic engineering venture first began in the 1970s, its practitioners presumed that genes act independently, and that they're not arranged in an organized manner, and that the sequence in which they occur is essentially unimportant. It's been called the beanbag theory of the genome. You have a beanbag, you shake it up, all the positions of the beans change, you still got the beanbag. It doesn't matter what position they're in. That's the way the genome was viewed by the molecular biologists, and uh, even well into the 80s, that was the viewpoint. Even into the 90s, even after that, uh, those presumptions were decisively uh, refuted. They hung on. Actually, let me go into those presumptions a little more. So based on that beanbag theory, based on that very constricted uh, understanding of the genome, they uh, presume that the genome is a simple linear system, which the action of a single gene will not significantly impact the others and won't disrupt their normal function. Th that's they f because they felt that the genes act independently. They're kind of independent agents, not acting in a highly coordinated manner. So this, uh, this is summarized by Denise Caruso, a veteran technology reporter for the New York Times. In an article that was published July 1, 2007, she stated, the presumption that genes operate independently has been institutionalized since 1976 when the first biotech company was founded. In fact, it is the economic and regulatory foundation on which the entire biotechnology industry is built. Together, these two presumptions supported the belief that a chunk of recombinant DNA could be wedged into a plant's genome without inducing disturbance. Because if the behavior of the native genes was largely uncoordinated and their arrangement was irrelevant, there would be no important patterns that could be perturbed. Accordingly, they engendered confidence in the precision of genetic engineering by implying that its results would be consistently predictable. However, these influential assumptions, which provided the ideological foundation for a colossal endeavor to transform agriculture, have been decisively discredited. Abundant evidence has demonstrated that there is a high degree of coordination between genes and that their arrangement is highly organized. And this evidence undermines the claims about the safety of genetic engineering. Thus, in her previously mentioned New York Times article, Denise Caruso asserted, evidence of a network genome shatters the scientific basis for virtually every official risk assessment of today's commercial biotech products, from genetically engineered crops to pharmaceuticals. Now, it's important to emphasize that Caruso's comments were made without even taking a co the evidence from computer science into consideration. So when that powerful body of knowledge is additionally taken into account, it's clear that the GE food venture is not only seriously unsound, but downright reckless. But what about the new modes of manipulating uh, genomes, such as CRISPR-Cas9, that are promoted as very precise forms of genome editing that are more precise than the former versions of genetic engineering? Well, from the standpoint of uh, computer science, the answer still has to be no. No, they're more precise, but they're certainly not precise enough. For instance, these techniques can induce accidental off-target effects. Further, as is the case with the previous modes of genetic engineering, in order to transform the altered plant cells into seed-bearing plants, something has to be done. Now, this is very important. The genetic engineers are not working with fertile seeds. They can't, not up to this stage, and they probably won't ever be able to. They're taking cells from mature plants, and then they are genetically engineering those cells. Now, even if they end up with the genetic manipulation, the genetic alteration they want, they don't have, those cells can't be put in the ground and grown into a plant. So, a very unnatural, uh, process referred to as tissue culture 
has to be employed in which a series of hormone, plant hormones and, uh, and nutritives are added uh, and the plant grows in, th that cell will, can be coaxed, actually forced to grow into a mature plant, but the process through the which that happens is not precisely the same as the process through which a seed will grow into a mature plant. And in fact, it's a disruptive process. Tissue culture is known to be highly mutagenic. In fact, it's been used just to create mut mutations in order to see if they could find something good. And some scientists have referred to the effects that it has on the organism as a genomic shock. It imparts a genomic shock. So <laughs> no matter how precise the CRISPR technology can be on the upside, on the uh, uh, on the first, on the manipulation side, as long as they're going to have to use tissue culture to get the, their creation into a plant, there's no way they can claim it's precise, it's highly mutagenic. And it's very irresponsible to ignore tissue culture. And most, uh, most uh, promoters of GE foods always, in, uh, they, they try to pretend it doesn't exist, it's not part of the process. It is part of the process in almost every case. So really another level of misrepresentation. So from the standpoint of computer science, the process of produ producing new agricultural plants by utilizing these new techniques is in its entirety imprecise and inherently risk laden and the plants must be rigorously tested. Thus, if we cut through the promotional propaganda that's been passed off as science and we carefully examine genetic engineering in the light of our best scientific knowledge, knowledge accrued both from biological science and from computer science, it becomes clear that the GE venture is incurably risky and that the risks are unacceptable, especially when safe, sustainable, and well-proven alternatives are readily available. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're listening to uh, Stephen Drucker speaking on the problems with GMO crops. And now it's time for audience questions. I prepared a few here, but I'd like other people in the audience to um, write your questions out and pass them up to the uh, front here. Okay. The first question is, which foods sold in the United States are genetically engineered? <laughs> and the shorter answer is far too many. <laughs> um, because even though a fairly small uh, number of, of uh, crops relative to the vast number of food crops out there have been genetically engineered and reached the market to date, because their major uh, foods that are that appear as ingredients in most processed foods, to date, we, we'd say in the United States, it's been estimated that between 85 and 90 percent of all processed food, that means foods that you'll buy in a package, contain one or another ingredient derived from a GMO, a genetically modified organism. So the main, the main genetically engineered organisms on the market in North America, it's not just the United States, it's also Canada. Canada has these crops on the market, no labeling. The Canadian regulators are almost as bad as the FDA, which is saying a lot, just a bit better because Canadians tend to be a bit more polite and reasonable, but on, GE, on genetically engineered foods, they're unscientific. So m corn, which is more commonly referred to as maize in most other parts of the word, world, Soy, well over 90% probably of the, of the uh, North American soy and corn crop have been genetically engineered. Think of how many, ingre how many different foods ingredients from soy and cord corn appear in. And canola, uh, canola uh, seeds have been genetically engineered, most of the Canadian crop. Again, canola oil appears in many products and many products that purport to be health foods because they think canola oil is better than some other kind of oil. But if, it, if it's not certified GMO free, which very little of it is, then it's, got, it's probably been genetically engineered. Uh, a significant 
proportion of the Hawaiian papaya crop has been genetically engineered. Uh, a very substantial portion of the sugar beet crop in the United States has been genetically engineered, which means if you're eating a product that says sugar but doesn't say cane sugar, then it's most likely cane sugar, and that in turn is most likely to have been genetically engineered. Um, the um, alfalfa, which many of you might think, well, that's not really a problem for me. Actually, it is, especially if you try to eat organic dairy products, because during winter months, uh, uh, organic alfalfa is one of the main uh, substance, uh, foodstuffs that organic dairy farmers feed their, their cattle. And alfalfa cross-pollinates to a very uh, large degree, and therefore there's significant risk of cross-pollination contamination of organic alfalfa by the, by the genetically engineered alfalfa. Uh, there are probably some others. Those are the really, those are the big ones. Actually, this is a shocker, a zucchini. Um, many years ago, a virus-resistant genetically engineered version of zucchini was, zucchini was created. But then most of us were told that it really didn't make it into the market very much, maybe only a few percentage, uh, a little pr small, very small percentage of the zucchini was affected, and then most of that really left the market. And then a few years ago, uh, reliable sources began telling us, well, actually, it appears now that far more zucchini, genetically engineered zucchini permeated the market than was initially thought, and chances are that anywhere between 10 and 25 percent of it could be. Now, that's pretty significant. Again, I don't have all the verification, but um, that's the trouble. We don't know. It's not labeled. The FDA doesn't even require, get this, the FDA doesn't even require a manufacturer to inform it before it dumps a genetically engineered food on the market. So the FDA has even acknowledged it doesn't even know for sure all of the GMOs that are on our market because it's actually gone out of its way to stay ignorant as much as it can. So that's why we don't really know. We're, to a large extent, we meaning the consumers in the United States and in Canada are, have to a large extent been left in the dark and it was, the system was purposely designed to keep us in the dark without labeling, with, you know, with very inadequate information. And most of the so-called information that's been dispensed to the consumers has been actually disinformation and has been very, very effective. Which countries ban GE crops? Um, I am not up to date on that. Most European Union, most countries in the European Union do not permit the planting of genetically engineered crops. Spain has, has allowed the planting of some genetically engineered corn. Things may have shifted. So that's one area I'm not completely up to date on. Uh, as far as the planting, there's a major push going on by the European biotech industry, by the European Commission, by some national governments, uh, especially the UK government, to try to, to get genetically engineered crops uh, approved for growing. And there's a lot of consumer resistance. So that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But uh, there are some countries that really are trying to be very strong GE-free zones. I believe Austria and Hungary in the European Union in, in Europe are two of the strongest. But here's a very interesting fact. Even though GMOs really can't be grown in most European regions, and even though they have been approved for marketing uh, for the human food supply, uh, several of them have been approved, but it's consumer resistance that have essentially kept them off the shelves because in the EU, genetically engineered food, any foods that contain ingredients from genetically engineered foods have to be labeled. And therefore, the major retailers don't want to be involved because they know that the, that the consumers in Europe are much more educated about the risks than the consumers in North America. One reason is that the European uh, media back in the earlier days actually reported on some of the early studies that showed problems, whereas there was pretty much a media blackout here in North America. So that goes a long way to, uh, attribute to attributing the difference in consumer attitude. But I think about as early as 2000, maybe even before, there was so much resistance among consumer groups in the European Union, certainly wasn't everybody, but it was enough 
that the, ma that the food manufacturers and especially the major food distributors realized putting, you know, putting these foods out is not going to be a good marketing. And they very clear made it very clear to the biotech industry and to the farmers, we're not going to carry it. So that made a major change. So consumer power is very important. I'm mentioning that because enough, if enough consumers in the U.S. and in Canada become more informed and begin to vote with their pocketbook, the, the, uh, the industry take, the food industry takes note of that. In fact, it doesn't take a very big shift in consumer habits to, to make the food industry make a shift. You don't have to even have 50%. I think the thing is, it can be as small as five or 10% shift that can make a big difference and make one brand no longer carried, no longer viable. So I'm, I'm mentioning this because informed consumers have great power, the power of the pocketbook. Oh, I do want to say there's a major loophole in Europe, and that is that genetically engineered soy or corn or cottonseed cakes that are fed to the farm animals, the ultimate consumer product, the meat, the milk, the eggs, they don't have to be labeled. So that's a huge, I wouldn't even call it a loophole, you know, I'd call it a, a, a huge hole in the wall. And therefore, Europeans, consumers who often think, oh, we haven't been eating GMOs, they've been eating products derived from GMO-fed animals. And the head of the Center for Veterinary Medicine at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, in, in his memo, written on his behalf and behalf of the other the, the numerous other scientists at the Center for Veterinary Medicine stated that he and his colleagues viewed feeding farm animals high doses of genetically engineered crops, which happens, and then feeding the resultant uh, meat and milk and eggs to humans raised unique human food safety problems, and they thought there should be very careful testing of that situation, but there hasn't been such testing. Uh, what health effects arise from eating GE corn, soybeans, et cetera. I hope I got that right. And well, we don't know fully what health effects have been happening because there hasn't been good testing going on. We know people have been getting sick in the United States, that illnesses keep increasing. We know many illnesses have been increasing. You know, you can kind of correlate the introduction of genetically engineered foods and the increased use of the herbicides that have gone up in, in use because so many of the genetically engineered crops have been engineered to be tolerant to applications of herb herbicide that would otherwise kill them and will kill everything else that's gr just about everything else that's green in the surroundings, except maybe the jolly green giant. He's pretty tough. But um, we don't really know. Uh, we do know the kinds of, uh, there have been, as I said, liver and kidney toxicity that have been determined to have been uh, induced in rats that ate genetically engineered crops. We've seen other kinds of problems as well. But you have to consider the case of tobacco, okay? Even as late as 1962, people could have claimed there is no evidence that smoking cigarettes has caused any harm to human beings. And at that point, there wasn't any solid epidemiological evidence yet. It hadn't been published. Epidemiological studies had been underway for many years, but it wasn't until I think around 1963 or 64 that they were published and there was enough evidence that then the Surgeon General required warnings. Then we knew there was cause and effect. But it's, and, re, and look at the differences. Tobacco had been smoked for a lot longer than genetically engineered foods, and people who were smoking cigarettes or cigars knew that they were, okay? And they knew when they started. And they knew, on average, how many cigarettes or cigars they'd been smoking per month. Okay. Does anyone here know precisely when he or she ingested the first genetically engineered food and what it was? And have you been keeping a list of the different GMOs you've been ingesting and what concentrations? Of course not. You couldn't have. They're not labeled. So epidemio I've spoken on panels with epidemiologists, and they all agree it would be well nigh impossible at this stage to even conduct epidemiological studies on GMO foods in North America. It just couldn't be done. And it was planned to be that way, okay? For one reason, 
the manufacturers can avoid liability a lot more easily. But look at how long it took, even in the case of tobacco, to finally start getting loss, you know, judgments and monetary awards against the tobacco companies. Even with that, think how difficult, again, well nigh impossible it would be to prove that somebody was injured by a particular GMO when there's so many out there and, well, again, the burden of proof would be very, very immense. And that's why our food safety laws are precautionary. Here in the U United States, we have the strictest precautionary laws when it comes to food additives, and those laws cover the additives that are being added through genetic engineering. We have the strictest laws on the book, stricter than the European Union. Most people are amazed by that because, well, wait, there aren't any GMOs on the market in the EU, and uh, the supermarkets in the U.S. and Canada are flooded with them. And, it, and if the U.S. has them everywhere, our laws must be weaker. No, our laws are stronger. What's weaker is the will to enforce the law in the case of genetically engineered foods. And as my book demonstrates very solidly, the Food and Drug Administration has been violating food safety law since 1992 in order to usher genetically engineered foods onto the market and without any requirements for any testing. But according to law, these foods should have been tested. That's the law. But uh, again, the law is just one of, so one of the greatest injuries that's been caused by the GE food venture is the injury to scientific integrity and integrity of regulators in the US and Canada and many other countries. And hopefully there won't be uh, a great deal of human injury that results, but the laws in the EU are supposed to be precautionary. The EU is supposed to be following the precautionary principle. My book shows it has not been. And the US government, by law, our laws are very strictly precautionary. Every genetically engineered food by law is presumed to be unsafe until demonstrated safe. And the standard of, test, uh, standard of, of proof is very high. There has to be a demonstration of reasonable certainty of no harm. Okay, you can't even factor in benefits according to the law. Risk-benefit balancing in the case of food additives is actually contrary to law in the US. You do that in the case of pharmaceutical drugs, but it's inappropriate to do it in the case of food. Food is over the counter. Everybody eats food. It should be safe to a reasonable certainty of no harm. I'm just going into all of this because there wasn't time to bring it out in the main body of the talk, and I think it's apropos, and you should all know it. What about the herbicides that GE crops can tolerate but other plants cannot? Well, I touched upon that briefly. One thing that I think is very important to note, and many, many activists and many critics of GE foods actually get mis, uh, they can get m misled by this, and it's, it's, well, first, they focus too much on the herbicides, Roundup in particular. Roundup is Monsanto's brand of herbicide, the most widely uh, sold and, and used herbicide in the world, I'm pretty sure. And uh, Monsanto, of course, has been claiming that it's completely safe, no problem. And uh, recently, experts uh, in Europe have stated they feel it's, there's enough evidence to show it's a, it's a probable or possible human carcinogen. State of California actually has taken a similar position. Monsanto can come up with other scientists who claim, no, the data doesn't show, we don't think it's a carcinogen. There's this huge debate going on now about is it a carcinogen or isn't it a carcinogen? Listen, that whole thing is taking, taking the eye off the ball, and that is that there has been solid research published that shows that, that uh, Roundup is toxic. It's a toxin. It's been demonstrated, solid toxicological studies. So even if it is not a carcinogen, it's been shown to be a toxin. It shouldn't be on the market. And this, the whole debate is, seems to be going off into the clouds of potential carcinogenity, carcinogenicity, which is more difficult to prove, but the demonstration of toxicity has been made. Uh, it's interesting, one of the main studies was published in a peer-reviewed journal, but because Monsanto did not like it, it showed not only was the Roundup administered to the, to the rats on its own toxic, it showed that the particular genetically brand of Monsanto's genetically engineered Roundup-resistant corn 
that was being tested, if that was fed to the rats, even not sprayed with Roundup, it also was toxic, had toxic effects. So it showed there was something bad about the corn in itself, something about the corn that wasn't good even when unsprayed, and something very harmful about the Roundup itself when administered to the same dose that it would have been uh, that would have been administered if the corn had been eaten. That study alone should have driven Roundup off the market, along with that particular brand of corn and probably all the other GE corn. What happened? Instead, through a major uh, assault upon, basically major assault upon the research, the researchers, and major pressure put upon the editorial board of that journal, just recently it came out that Monsanto was actually orchestrating that attack, getting uh, so-called independent scientists to do its dirty work for it, but now there are memos that were uncovered in a lawsuit against Monsanto showing that Monsanto was heavy hand in it, that finally after about a year of that pressure, um, what the, uh, the uh, study was retracted. Now, it's interesting, before the retraction occurred, and it may not have occurred until this happened, this event, a former executive of, uh, of Monsanto was added to the review board of that journal and then the retraction occurred. Was it cause and effect? I don't know. Does it smell fishy? You bet. Now, the another important point to know is, and this is again a case, should I wrap this up? Okay, this is a case again of sleight of hand. Okay, now that study was a solid toxicological study. The, the part of the study that showed that Roundup and the genetically engineered corn it were both independently toxic to the rats. That was solid toxicological study. It could not be assailed legitimately. So when the so then the journal editor was faced with the situation, how do I, if we're gonna retract it, what are the grounds for retraction? The main study, it was a toxicological study. That was the study. It just so happened that because it was a long-term study, longer than Monsanto's initial study had been, longer than almost all the other studies had been, some tumors developed. Now, according to research guideline, if tumors develop in the course of a toxicological study, it is the duty, it is the duty of the researcher to report them. They don't have to try to analyze them, what they just report the tumors, and that's what the researchers did. So all of a sudden, the, the grounds for retraction are that it's, that the toxicological, the, I'm sorry, the carcinogen, the cancer part of the study, they didn't even mention the, car, the, the word cancer, they didn't try to determine if the tumors were cancerous, they just reported them. So you said, well, the, the, cancer, the cancer evidence is inconclusive and therefore we're retracting the study. Now, of course, it wasn't even a cancer study anyway, and Inconclusive results are not official grounds for retraction. You won't find that in the guidelines for how uh, governing retraction of articles. Then, uh, so anyway, and then uh, I think when the editor, this is all, the story's all in my book, I think the editor then had to come up with something else. But the fact remains, in the media, you will see the debate is on cancer. Well, this, this was shown not to have caused cancer. The thing is, it did cause damage to livers and kidneys, and that was a sound toxicological study. And no, a number, dozens and dozens of well-credentialed experts have written articles or letters to the editor explaining that that shouldn't have been retracted. By the way, the guidelines are, if part of a study is invalid, and this one really wasn't, but it, even if it is unreliable, what you do is you retract that part and you maintain the valid parts, but they didn't do that. They retracted the whole study. So again, this is showing how science has been subverted in order to keep a happy face on the genetically engineered uh, venture. And it's really astounding, but you will read, even in the New York Times, they talk about the carcinogenicity carcinogen study, the cancer study, that it wasn't demonstrated, and they completely ignore the evidence of toxicity, which was solid and never should have been retracted. So that's just a little taste. Okay, go ahead and answer all the questions you have. Okay. Uh, so that's something about the herbicides. Any thoughts about the GE salmon, the fast-growing GE salmon that was 
okayed for market this week. Well, yeah, the, be the fact that it was genetically engineered means, again, that there, uh, we should presume that there are unintended uh, side effects that have occurred that could be harmful. That, that's the default, that's applying the default presumption that the expert panel that released the Royal Society of Canada's report uh, stated there should be. That sounds science. Now again, with the salmon, the focus is on a lot of other issues, environmental ones, which there are, but just the fact it's been produced through genetic engineering should be setting off major flashing red lights. There are inescapable risks. There should be extensive uh, food safety testing, toxicological taste testing, using you know feeding studies, using animals eating the fish for long term. There probably will not be. Okay, I've gone through that stack pretty much. Where are the bodies? <laughs> With trillions of GE meals provided to over nine billion animals, there should be abundant results to the death or illness of animals. Please address Va Dr. Von Eneman's study from UC Davis. Well, actually, it's interesting. First, the question, where are the human bodies? I just went through that. There haven't been epidemiological studies. Where are the animal bodies? Now, the Van Eneman study, that was done, she's a, I believe, a, a veterinarian. So they looked at, they looked at really the, the, the superficial analyses of the animals before they're gonna be slaughtered. Correct me if I state anything wrong on this. It's been a while since I looked at this. Again, I just got, I think it's in an end note in my book. Um, you can find a very good critique of that study on the website GM Watch, GM Watch, excellent critique. And there are many scientists have criticized that, that study. For one thing, they're not, it's not a long-term study. Also, those animals are being fattened up pretty quickly for market. Only a fairly short amount of their lifespan uh, has been taken into account. Also, those are not the extensive kinds of studies uh, that would be done, you know, analyzing tissues under the microscope. It's fairly gross. That's my recollection of it. Those are not, and also they're not controlled studies. If, here's, here's one thing. If, if uh, critics of genetically engineered food had brought out studies that were that weak, lack of controls, all of the things I've mentioned and more so, they'd be pilloried. Everybody would blast it. And yet, very weak studies that purport to, uh, to find safety are put through. I mean, are, are, are put on a pedestal like like the study that has been mentioned. Here's another important fact. Cows have very different digestive systems than human beings. How many of you chew your cud? Okay, you don't, okay? Cows have more than one stomach. Their digestion is different. They would make very bad laboratory animals if we wanted to do toxicology tests for human beings. That's why rats and mice that have much more similar digestive systems to ours are used, among other things. Uh, so again, even if they've been doing very precise uh, you know, studies and really doing dissections and, and looking at the, the tissues the way that are done in toxicological studies, genuine ones, it still would not be compelling evidence that these foods are safe for human beings. So I won't go more deeply into it. I would refer you to that uh, critique on GM Watch that summarizes many of the criticisms that other scientists have leveled. Uh, I answered that one. What role does Bayer purchasing Monsanto play in GMO planning in Europe? Um, it will probably create increased pressure to do it, although Many of the major biotech companies in Europe had, uh, had announced they were pretty much giving up on the European market because there's such consumer resistance. Whether they really are giving up or just waiting for an opportunity to push ahead, I don't know for sure. But uh, that, uh, I think we'll just have to wait and see. However, the merger of, of Bayer and, uh, and Monsanto probably is not gonna, I, I think we can predict it's not going to be a good thing for consumers, for the environment. Uh, what, oh, what can I as a consumer do to protect myself? Uh, move to Norway. 
<laughs> um, you have to get informed. Um, there are a lot of very good books about it. My book is not a guide to how to enjoy ge avoid genetically engineered foods. It should be a strong inducement to do so, though. Uh, but there are guides. There are many good guides. Uh, the uh, Organic Consumers Association has a, a lot of good guides on their website. I think they try to keep that up updated to give you a little shopper's guide. Uh, Institute for Responsible Technology, I believe, also keeps a good updated one. I assume the non-GMO project, non-GMO verified project, but there are many good websites, Center for Food Safety, very informative, and they will, g you can download, you know, some guides as to how to shop intelligently. So I highly recommend that you do the, re it's easy to at least get that research done online. What's difficult is to follow the advice because the food supply in the U.S. and Canada is loaded with GMOs, and it's you've got to really read labels, and it's it's a pretty daunting thing. And especially at restaurants, it's even harder. So um, it depends on what level of rigor you want to apply in avoiding GMOs. And uh, but if you really want to avoid them, be rigorous. If you do have young children or you have grandchildren, you should be especially careful in their case because you know children's physiology, they're in a developmental stage. It's a very delicate situation. It takes a lot less of something toxic or carcinogenic generally to create a problem for a, a little child than it does for a grown adult. So if you, if you can't be fully rigorous for yourself, try to make sure there's more rigor for the children and the loved ones in your life who are children. I would, I would say that's highly, highly important. The um, non-GMO project verified label, it's a voluntary thing, but it's increasingly found on, on foods. That gives a pretty high level of confidence that there aren't genetically engineered ingredients. But be aware, many people make the mistake of thinking if that label's on it, then the product is organic. No, it just means it doesn't have GMOs, but it could have, you know, could have had pesticides sprayed on it. So you you have to look for the organic label as well. If it says it's USDA certified organic, it should mean it should mean that it's not genetically engineered. But unfortunately, there doesn't have to be testing. And because of the contamination through cross-pollination, it's possible, and in fact, it's been, it's been documented in some cases, that over the generations, even organic crops have a significant amount of contamination from genetically engineered crops that are the same or similar species. So the gold standard would be certified organic and non-GMO project verified, and sometimes you can get that. But I'm just stating that would probably be the gold, I think the gold standard right now in, uh, in North America. I think, oh wait, oh, are all organic foods non-GMO? Well, I kind of answered that. Ideally, yes, in practice, there's been some significant contamination. Are there any countries that do not allow G foods to be sold or cross? I answered that one to the best of my ability. Oh, what about the concept that there isn't enough food supply to feed the global population without GE foods? That's more baloney. They're feeding us baloney, and that kind of baloney will not feed the world, the third world. Listen, I mean, again, it's just ignoring the, 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 the data. Okay, in 2008, uh, a, a major study was released. It had been co-sponsored by the World Bank, hardly a radical organization, the World Bank and four United Nations agencies, hundreds of experts, scientific experts, in numerous countries around the world participated in it, and it was basically assessing the future of food, the, uh, an assessment of agriculture, agricultural technology, uh, and the future of food. And it went on for a long time, and, ex and when the results were published, they made it very clear, because they, they examined, one of the questions was, what role should or could genetic engineering play? And they concluded genetic engineering does not have a significant role to play in meeting the world's future 
nutritional needs for the foreseeable future. And at a press conference, at the press conference announcing that study, the director of the study was asked point blank, so do you see any role at all for genetically engineered foods? And he said, no, well, the frank answer is no. I think I should, the simple answer is no. And the, his co-chairman basically made a similar a uh, similarly strong statement. There have been other studies, there have been studies released by the UN Special Rapporteur for Food reviewing, uh, reviewing many projects in sub-Saharan Africa employing organic or near organic techniques uh, that have shown tremendous results, results that as he has said are better than any genetically engineered food has been able to, uh, to achieve. So the so what the, the UN Rapporteur on Food and what that major study I discussed have recommended as the main solution, especially for the developing world, they called them agroecological te agro techniques. That basically means good old traditional uh, farming without industrial inputs, without synthetic uh, fertilizers, without synthetic herbicides, without GMOs, and with greater intelligence because many traditional societies have actually lost a lot of their traditional knowledge or they didn't have good enough knowledge in some cases. And a little bit of, re you know, there's a lot of experimenting in different ecological niches. Amazing results have been reported and will continue to be reported. So organic or near organic techniques uh, on small farms, again, if the industrial methods come in, then usually small farms have to consolidate. So they emphasized small independent farms using agroecological techniques. They've been shown to be actually the most efficient and productive. You can produce more nutrition per acre if you're doing it that way than with these big industrialized farms. What the big industrialized farms are good at is producing monocrops. You know, one uniform crop planted on a massive amount of acres they are more efficient at producing more of that crop per acre, but not at producing more nutrition because the smaller farms, they don't do the monocropping. They have a synergy of many different kinds of crops and they have much more nutrient density harvested per acre or per hectare, depending on which, which labeling system you want to use, than the big industrial farms. That's been a well-verified fact. So again, we do not need genetic engineering. What we need, and in, if just a small amount of the massive research that's been directed to genetic engineering since, it, since genetically engineered foods start, started being developed in the early 80s, we would have, uh, there would be so much better knowledge and so much more food being produced in the third world because very little money, relatively speaking, is still being given to organic and agroecological. It's really a shame. But that's the, that's the case. So there should be a diversion of funds. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation should be stopping, should stop funding the development of genetically engineered foods. You know, he is the richest man in the world, or used to be, he, he now I guess is seesawing with other people, but he's one of the richest. His wealth has come from software development. And yet he is using a significant part of that substantial, massive fortune to fund a technology that is violating the basic principles of software development. I mean, it's one of the most ironic of the iron ironic situations, and there are many ironies in the GE food venture. That's maybe the one of the biggest. I think that if Bill and or Melinda Gates were to read my book, there would be a huge turnaround. They have been misinformed. Their intentions are good. They're hoping to do good for the third world, but they've been listening to scientists who have been misinforming them. And if they were to learn the facts and especially to examine genetic engineering from the standpoint of software engineering, I think there would be a major eureka experience. And I think that they, they would probably speak out too. But Bill Gates, they're both bright people. He's a voracious reader. So if any of you, I'm saying this, who knows, maybe some of you have a contact, tell him to read my book. I think that would have one of the greatest, greatest turnarounds in the history of agriculture. Any other, oh wait, I should just look. Where are we now with the legal process against Monsanto? Uh, well, there, there's at least one, if not more lawsuits underway against Monsanto 
that, that uh, information that I said came out from their files that showed how Monsanto was orchestrating most of the attack against that study that was retracted eventually. By the way, because that, excuse me, because that study was solid, because it was really a solid toxicological study, it was republished eventually in another peer-reviewed journal. So it is currently, you know, a published study, although uh, the Royal Society and its most recent question and answer consumer guide uh, basically dismissed that as a study that had been retracted. They didn't even tell people that it had been republished. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of, that's the kind of un unethical behavior being practiced by the world's most prestigious scientific organization. So I'm not sure that process is on behalf of people who have been injured, claim to have been injured by glyphosate. So that's specifically, by Roundup, that's specifically, I believe, against that. There may be some other lawsuits. Uh, I'm not aware of that. My main focus is to get the facts out. There's an ancient Sanskrit saying of which I'm very fond, satyam eva jayate, truth ultimately triumphs. It may be old fashioned on my part, but I still firmly believe that. It may take a lot longer than we like, certainly it's taken agonizingly longer than I would like, but eventually the truth will triumph in regard to genetically engineered foods. There's only so long that the proponents can keep a lid on all of the facts that I've just shared with you and the many more facts that are in my book and in some other very good books on the topic. One of which I should mention is GMO Myths and Truths, excellent book. And uh, in fact, you can even download a copy of that for free. It's not the narrative story that mine is. It doesn't give the history, won't give the computer science, but my book and that book complement each other because it goes into the research even more thoroughly than mine. Mine would be even longer than it is and too dry, but I do go into the research a lot. So I would say if you can only read two books, then mine and GMO Myths and Truths. If you could only read one, I'm not gonna try to, you flip a coin or whatever. So uh, what kind of testing do you believe would be necessary to allow, for example, a tomato to market? Who would do the testing? First, the testing should not be allowed, not continue to be allowed to be conducted by the researchers that are hired by the industry. It's been shown too many often, too often that that leads to fraud. And even if it doesn't lead to fraud, it's studies have shown that if independent researchers look at the data, they are much more likely to find problems than if the researchers that are hired by the company do. So that should be a major change throughout really testing on any chemicals, industrial chemicals, food additives, the food additives that really are specific to GMOs. Get, get, uh, get the private sector out of it. And I'm not sure exactly the best way, probably making people pay and have the government, you know, con uh, hire people to do the testing, double blind, they don't even know what, whether they've got, who's, who's one they have, and keep it all double blind, and all the results have to be completely reported. When, it, when the testing is under the control of the private corporations, if they don't like the results, they just don't publish them. And they usually have the, uh, have the researchers sign an agreement that they don't have the right to basically publish it. All the decisions are made by the Monsantos, the DuPonts, whoever. Well, if you're not publishing the negative results, you know, that's not science. And of course, as I mentioned, even some of the studies that have been published had negative results that were overlooked and were only discovered when the independent teams reviewed them. So that's one of the important things. Also, as my book demonstrates, as I, as I mentioned to, to this evening, or I hope I made it clear, there would have to be at least the same kind of testing, rigorous long-term testing culminating in human clinical trials on the part of GMOs, uh, on, in the case of GMOs, as in the case of pharmaceutical drugs. It should probably be even stricter but even that would completely down the industry because think about it, that level of extensive, uh, extensive testing is enabled because drug companies can take out patents and for the first many years, so many years, that their drug is on the market, they have a patent on it and they can charge pretty high prices before it goes generic. You can, there's only so much you can charge for a soybean or an ear of corn, so there's a, a natural economic constraint 
in the case of the food industry, on how long and extensive the testing can be. And so really, there is no way for the genetically engineered food venture to be scientific reli scientifically reliable and yet economically viable, okay? Cannot be scientifically reliable and at the same time economically viable. So again, that's why the industry fights uh, so hard to have minimal testing and tries to and attacks so viciously any research that uh, again indicates that there should be stronger testing because it would be very expensive and they don't want it. Uh, is wheat a GMO crop? To the best of our knowledge right now, it is not a GMO marketed crop. It's been experimented in the lab. There have been, it came close to being rolled out, I think at least once if not twice. My understanding is there's pressure building again to get it out, but uh, unless it's escaped test fields, which may have happened, um, it is not an officially marketed genetically engineered crop now, and let's all have our attention on, on it never becoming one. Given that GMO crops drift onto conventional crops, how do we know they don't drift onto certified organic crops? Oh, we know that they have. I mean, there have been shipments of canola that were certified organic canola seeds from Canada to Europe that were tested there and found to have a significant level of contamination from genetically engineered canola. Those were rejected, I mean, it, and sent back. So we know that that can happen. Um, I don't eat meat because it isn't healthy for humans. Am I safer than those who eat meat? Well, uh, I don't, that's not, a, that's, that's kind of not on topic. Many people would think that it is healthier. Many would give arguments not. I myself am a vegetarian, but I'm not an expert on, on this. I just know I like to eat that way. But I have many friends who are very healthy and very health conscious that eat meat. They eat a high quality meat. They're very careful. And for them, it works. So I think everybody should study. People have different nutritional needs. Uh, and But I think one thing is clear. The current sis industrial system of embracing meat is very wrong, very, very harmful to the animals. Uh, you know, these big confined animal feeding operations are sinful, actually. <laughs> they really are creating, they're torturing the animals in many ways. And uh, the animals live in constant stress. They're not able, they are not able to live out their lives as animals. And it's really wrong. They're treated as, treated as units of production. So to the extent that, that animals are raised for slaughter, they should be raised in a humane way. And that means a fundamental change has to be made throughout most modern systems of industrialized agriculture. And if the animals are raised humanely, it is going to drive up the cost, and it means people will be eating less meat. But that was the way it used to be. You know, chicken used to be a lot more expensive. Beef was much more expensive. It's become very much cheaper now, but at what cost to the environment, potentially human health cost, and certainly a cost, to, I think, to the human soul because of the way in which those animals, those and they are sentient beings, they are being treated so callously and carelessly. It, as I said, for those of us who believe in sin, it is a sin. And if you don't, then it's just very, very wrong. And when I say sin, I just mean it is really, <laughs> it's really wrong and they should consider the pain to which they're subjecting those animals. It's very, very wrong. How does Monsanto play into this? I think we've discussed it in a very dirty way. Uh, where are we now with the legal pro, okay, that was read. Okay, I think I've gone through most of them. Did I miss something? 